in big history instead of the other one. What is it? Foundations. Yeah. Yeah. You guys the no, didn't even know. You didn't get to decide. No, we did. Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah. So did you? But you didn't know how good you were gonna have it. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you know. Um, so that was quite a quite a nice chapter. Uh, Ms. Rogers sent me the, what you guys had read for the last uh, two nights. I think. Uh, it's pretty dense, a lot of information in there about the, the Big Bang and uh, other origin uh, theories, right? So, um, can anyone just give a brief um, summary of the Big Bang theory and maybe where it first came from? Or what was the first piece of evidence? Did anyone um, take note of what was kind of the first piece of evidence that led people to think, Maybe there was some kind of Big Bang type event. I don't know names. Oh, we have name tags on. Oh, right. From art, just art. art class. Well, perfect. Art class oh, yeah. helps me see that your name Charlie. is Charlie. I have really bad handwriting. She probably couldn't tell even with the name tags. So, Charlie, what, what was something? Um, it was that uh, when we figured out um, how to uh, figure out whether stars are moving away from us or towards us using the Doppler effect on light. Exactly. Um, we found out that most of the stars are uh, red lighted, so they're moving away from us. Great. Um, so we thought that the universe was expanding. Perfect. So that was the first clue, right, that um, the universe was expanding. And how does that lead kind of to the Big Bang from there? Where do we go from there? Yeah. Well, if say your name, Anna. Anna. Hi. If the universe was expanding now, then it, at one point it had to have been smaller than it is today, and so that led to them thinking that maybe it started out say something really small. Great, exactly. So if the universe is expanding, right, it had to be expanding from something, and if you trace that back to its logical conclusion, right, it had to have been very small. So that is what led to the theory being developed of the, the Big Bang Theory. But just because you have a theory, right, doesn't mean it's going to be accepted and believed. So what they needed was further evidence right, that supported. So they needed to somehow observe to make uh, experimental observations that the Big Bang Theory is, is true. So they needed to somehow observe something that happened 13.8 billion years ago, right? Not easy to do unless you can somehow look into the past 13.8 billion years. We can. And we can, right? <laughs> and that is because um, it, light travels, um, or light doesn't travel instantly. So if we look... 13.8 billion light years away from Earth, we'll see what it looked like before um, or during, at, right when the universe was created. Exactly. Um, so it's, um, and the fact is, we don't even have to look that far away. We look right here and we, and we get a, a window into the, to the past there. So we're going to investigate a little bit more about what is the cosmic microwave background, okay, and how is it evidence for the Big Bang Theory. So, first of all, what is it? CMB, so just so we have it up here. Cosmic Microwave Background. So, we'll, I'll write it as CMB sometimes in the, in the PowerPoint, but you know, remember that it stands for Cosmic Microwave Background. So, um, cosmic, pretty straightforward, right? What does cosmic mean? It has to do with space, right? Microwave. So that's the next part. So the CMB is an electromagnetic wave. What does that mean? Everywhere in the universe, okay, there are electric and magnetic fields. That is, right here there's an electric field, right here is an electric field, here, 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 everywhere. We can't see them, okay? But what is the electric field is, is that it's that this particular point in space, every point in space, we can define a number for that point in space that tells us how charged particles react in that space. So does anyone know what one charged particle would be? What's like an example of a charged particle? Do you guys learn about that? Isotope, which 
See this electron or proton oh, rings yeah. bell, right? What's the charge on an electron? All right, good. You guys remember some stuff. So um, basically, the electric field is telling you how do electrons behave in that space. Okay. So if you know the electric field right here, you know what an, how an electron will respond if you put it in that space. And what an electromagnetic wave is, is that it's just a disturbance. It's a, it's a cyclical oscillating disturbance in that field. So um, just to show you what that looks like, I have a little simulation here. So here is like a radio station that's broadcasting. Okay, so when a radio station makes a broadcast, it, it broadcasts an electromagnetic wave. So it'll have an antenna, a broadcasting antenna, that sends some charged particles up and down. And that creates a wave in space, an electromagnetic wave. This is the electromagnetic wave. And what it is, it's just that the electric field right here is pointing up, and then it points down. And it points up, and then it points down. So if, if there was an electron here, it would move up when the electric field points up and down when it points down, okay? And so what you have is on your house, you have an, an antenna that has electrons in it that are responding to the electromagnetic wave that was created over here, okay? So that's what an electromagnetic wave is. It's a traveling disturbance that um, antennas can receive and turn it into a signal which carries information. So these electromagnetic waves carry information. That's really important. Electromagnetic waves carry information because of how they were created. All right. So the CMB is, an ele is a microwave, which is just a type of electromagnetic wave that has a certain frequency. Frequency is like how rapidly is the field changing up and down. So here's a whole spectrum of electromagnetic waves. So if the field changes up and down really fast, that's a high frequency wave, okay? Gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, those are high frequency electromagnetic waves. Microwaves are also electromagnetic waves, but they change more slowly. So the cosmic microwave background is that everywhere in the universe around us, we've detected an electromagnetic wave at a microwave frequency. Right? And that's why we call it the cosmic microwave background. We call it a background for reasons we'll see later. Okay? So what we've detected using spacecraft, so we've made these really fancy antennas, just like the ones you would have in your house, but obviously very different, right? We put them out in space to get them away from um, other signals. And we use these spacecraft to detect the CMB, to detect these electromagnetic waves um, that we know from what they look like came from the Big Bang. And we'll see why um, in a moment. So the, the question is, um, there's all this electromagnetic wave around us. How does it support, how, how do we know it came from the Big Bang? Why do we think it explains its uh, evidence for the Big Bang? And so what we need is for that evidence, what we've detected in this electromagnetic wave, to be linked to the Big Bang theory, right? To only be predicted and explained by this one theory. We need to have observations that directly um, match the theory. And so the only way we can do that is if we can somehow look back into the past, like Charlie was talking about earlier. And so what I want you to think about is that any time you look around, okay, when I look at you, okay, I'm not seeing you right now. I'm seeing you as you were when the light bounced off of you, so the light bounced off of you and came to my eye, right? But that light takes time. To, to travel that path. So I'm seeing you as you were a billionth of a second ago. That's weird, right? In fact, there's no such thing as now. This is a little side topic that you might enjoy. <laughs> but there is no now because everything we see is at a different distance away, right? 
So I'm seeing that stool as it was, you know, one billionth of a second ago, but I'm seeing my laptop as it was half a billionth of a second ago. But to me, I'm seeing them both as now, and our brain does that for us. But the farther away we look, the more we're looking at something the way it was and not the way it is, right? So the sun, our sunlight, has anyone heard about this? If the sun went out? It took eight seconds for the light to... It would take eight, 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 minutes. Take min eight minutes for us to know. So the, the sun could have gone out already, and we're, we're working on borrowed time here. But it, it didn't, we hope. <laughs> All right? But it's in the past, right? We're looking into the past here. What we're seeing with this electromagnetic wave, the CMB, is that it's been traveling for 13.8 billion years. So if we have our spacecraft right outside um, the Earth in orbit right now, Okay, that spacecraft is right here and it's receiving signals that originated 13.8 billion years ago. That's when they left, that's when they were created. Okay, so even though we're looking at those signals right now, they came from something 13.8 billion years ago, just like the light from the stool left the stool a billionth of a second ago. All right, so we have a way of looking and observing something that happened long, long ago. And there's a few features of that electromagnetic wave that are that make a, us um, that support the theory of the Big Bang. Okay. So the first is this: the Big Bang theory predicts that after the Big Bang, the universe was so hot and dense that atoms couldn't exist as we know them. Okay. Instead of having matter formed by protons and neutrons making up nuclei surrounded by electrons. The universe was just a cloud, a plasma of electrons and protons. And then photons. I, I didn't write this down, but the yellow dots represent light. Okay, So the yellow dots represent light, and then we have a cloud, a plasma of protons and electrons. And the interesting thing about this cloud is that the light in this plasma couldn't escape. All right, It couldn't escape because any time um, a photon of light was headed for outside of the cloud, it would bounce off an electron and scatter back in. All right? So they're trapped. So it's like they're bouncing all around, but they can't escape. Okay, So the light is stuck in this plasma. Until, so this is because it was so hot and so dense. But over time, the universe cooled down. All right? So instead of this really, really hot plasma, okay, it eventually got cool enough that the protons and electrons could combine into hydrogen. Previously, it was so hot that every time a proton and electron combined, they'd immediately get ripped apart again. All right? But... As the universe cooled, it became, instead of a plasma of ions, it became matter. We had a, a cloud of matter, okay, of hydrogen atoms. And these photons no longer scatter off of those ions because they don't interact with neutral hydrogen. So the photons, instead of being stuck in this plasma, are free to escape. That was a theory predicted by the Big Bang. Okay, that was part of the Big Bang Theory, was that at some point, 378,000 years after the, the initial Big Bang, okay, the light, there would have been a flash of light, because all of those photons would have been free to escape. All that light would have been free to escape. If that was the case, we should expect to be able to detect that light, because... It's traveling throughout the whole universe. And that's what we've detected. Is we've detected this very uniform release of energy. That's the same everywhere in the universe. Because if it all came from this one uniform plasma, we expect that everywhere in our universe it looks exactly the same. Okay? And what we've found is that the cosmic microwave background is extremely smooth. 
just like the Big Bang Theory predicted. The biggest differences are one part in 100,000. So it's like so smooth that the biggest difference is only one one hundred thousandth of the um, kind of regular level of radiation. All right. So it's as if, if you could put a number on it, if the, um, well, I'll leave that for now. Here's the comparison. If the Earth was this smooth, you could picture the Earth as being completely flat, and the tallest mountain would be only 100 meters tall. That's how smooth the CMB is in temperature. So not in height, but in temperature. So the temperature of the CMB is so even that the biggest difference is like a 100 meter mountain being the tallest mountain on Earth. It's extremely smooth. If the CMB was coming from something more recent or close than the Big Bang, then it wouldn't be that smooth because let's say the CMB was coming from the sun. Then if we looked at the sun, we would see a big bright spot, right? And if we looked away from the sun, it would be darker. It would be a big difference between looking at the sun and away from the sun. Whereas with the CMB, no matter where we look, it looks exactly the same. Because it's not coming from anywhere. It came from 13.8 billion years ago. And so, no matter where we look, it's the same. Okay? It's like if you look at a light source right here in the room. If you look at that light source, it's different than if you look away from it, right? Because it's so close. So there's a difference. If that light source was really, really far away, really, really, really far away, would it matter where you looked? No, right? You wouldn't be able to tell a difference where you looked. That's what we're seeing with the CMB. Okay. The other prediction made by the Big Bang Theory is that we can predict what temperature this, um, this uh, electromagnetic wave should be. Because we know how cool that plasma had to be to combine into hydrogen. It had to be 3,000 Kelvin, about. And from that, when those photons escaped, right, we know how hot those photons should be, about 3,000 Kelvin. However, as the universe expands, as predicted by the theory, we expect that radiation to cool. And since we know the expansion is about 1,100 times, the universe has expanded by about 1,100 times is the redshift, as you guys read about in the article. We expect that the, mic the, the radiation we detect now to be 1,100 times cooler than 3,000 degrees. So when it left that plasma, right? So here it was in the plasma, okay? And this is at... 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and then as it escaped, okay, the universe also expanded. And so as the universe expanded, this got cooler and cooler and cooler, proportional to how much the universe expanded by. All right, so if it was 3,000 degrees Kelvin, we expect that it's now 2.7 Kelvin, 2.727 Kelvin, because of the expansion of the universe. That's what the Big Bang Theory predicts for a temperature of that radiation. And the WMAP, which is our most, um, well, it was the one I showed you before, I think it was decommissioned in 2010. It found the temperature to be 2.725 Kelvin. Almost exactly what was predicted by the Big Bang Theory. Okay. So, we had this theory that predicted a very uniform, everywhere in the universe, everywhere in the universe, electric, electromagnetic wave at a specific temperature, and then we found it in the 1960s by accident. Does anyone remember how we found it? Uh, there, sure were, there were two guys who had this this big uh, micro. Er, antenna to pick up uh, radio signals and they accidentally found it because they had they had killed off all the nearby pigeons so they could eliminate that. <laughs> so, I mean, they just picked it up because they had a huge antenna. Yeah, they, they were trying to make this really, really sensitive antenna. So they were getting rid of all this background noise, but they couldn't get rid of this one background, which was the same everywhere, right? And they couldn't get rid of it. 
No matter where they pointed the antenna, it was the same. That's because it was the cosmic microwave background, and it happened to be at the exact temperature predicted by the Big Bang. So those two pieces of evidence right, are, are strong support for the Big Bang theory because this theory made these strange predictions, and, they, and, they, and then we observed them to be true. Okay. If we had observed it to be you know, 150 Kelvin, we would have had to go back to the drawing board, but no, it was exactly 2.725. Okay, great agreement. So that's a huge pillar of support for the Big Bang Theory, is the cosmic microwave background. And that was a big development, yeah. Um, is the CMB coming from all around us because we were inside the cloud of um, plasma, and so it's coming from all directions, or is it? Or are we unable to tell what direction it's coming from because it's so far away? So the answer to that is that we, our place in the universe, is within that plasma universe as well. Um, it's all around us because the universe has expanded. So if we were somewhere in that universe, right, and this whole universe has expanded, right. okay, it's still all around us, okay? Mm -hmm. um, because the Big Bang didn't happen at one point in the universe. It was the universe. Right, I, I understand that, but... Um... It's easy to like get lost in this thing. <laughs> I do it all the time. So I but, think. But, oh, can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. One of my students asked this in class, and I think the book also made reference to it. Uh, could you figure out where the center of the universe was using this theory? Where the center of the universe? Originally, yes. Oh, Did it come was, from a particular where place? Where the Big Bang came from? Yeah. So you want to get away from thinking of the Big Bang as an explosion that happened in one place in, and then filled into other space, what you want to think about is that the Big Bang was the appearance of the universe. So it happened everywhere at the same time in the universe. It didn't happen in one place in the universe and expand into other parts of the universe because those other there is no such thing as other parts of the universe. It just came into existence all at once in a, in a small space. But there was nothing outside of it. So to ask where the Big Bang happened in the universe does, is, is, doesn't make sense as a question because it happened everywhere in the universe at the same time. I'm trying to think of a good analogy. But I can't. Does that kind of make sense, though? It's like, I guess if you're thinking about this room, right, it's like as if um, it came into existence all at once everywhere, uh, the air in this room or something. It didn't just happen in the center of the room and, and then fill the room. It's just, it all happened at once, but in a small space. Okay, cool, yeah. So what caused, caused these like very small differences between... Uh... You were just talking about uh, how the hundred meter mountains. What caused oh, those very? That's a perfect very question. I think I did. I plant you. I can't remember. That, that's a no. great question. <laughs> uh, all right, that's what's next. So we've we've got the CMB. It's great evidence for the Big Bang theory. But now we want to use it to make other discoveries about the universe, right? We want to see what else can we get because this this is a ton of information about a time thirteen point eight billion years ago. Let's see if we can probe it for other discoveries about what that time was like, right? Now we know that, that that existed, but what was it like in that plasma? And what caused those slight differences? So what's next for the CMB is that better instruments, as our instruments get more and more precise, we can start to investigate those small differences in temperature of the, of the CMB. So here at first is a first map that was made by Kobe, which was one of the first spacecraft to, to detect this CMB. You can see it looks very um, uniform, 
right? There's not a lot of difference being shown there. There's some yellow, some green, but it's not a ton of difference because it wasn't a very precise instrument relative to the ones that came later. So as our instruments get better, we start to be able to really um, detect those differences in temperature of the CMB. And then uh, the Planck spacecraft is our most recent one, and it's even more precise. And so what we know is that where the CMB is cooler, where there's a spot on the map that's colder, so it may, maybe this blue area here or blue area here, that corresponds to a piece of that plasma, a section of that plasma, that was more dense. There was more matter packed into that little space. And so as the photons had to leave, they had to climb out of a gravitational well, and they lost some energy. It takes energy to get away from the matter, and so as a result, they're cooler. Okay, the, the photons that had to leave a more dense area we detect as being slightly cooler than the rest of the CMB. And vice versa, where it was less dense, we detect hotter CMB. And so from the, these maps, these fluctuation maps, we can start to get a sense of what that, the matter, how the matter was organized in this early universe, which is brand new to us. We, we've never been able to investigate that before. And so what we do is they, they take these maps of temperature where the different colors are showing slight fluctuations in the temperatures. Everyone get these maps? And we turn them into a graph, which is quantitative, right? If you have a graph showing how the temperature varies, so this is a really complicated graph that, to be honest, I don't fully understand. So don't try to uh, you know, figure out what, what, is the, what are they graphing here. But basically, it's just a graphical representation of these temperature color maps that they can then analyze using quantitative methods to figure out what was, how was the matter organized in that early plasma. Were there, were there really dense regions? How big were those dense regions? How dense were those dense regions? Okay. Uh, were they in any pattern? Or were they random? Um, yeah, those are some of the, the main questions that, that we want to answer. And the reason is that they tell us things about, for one, dark matter. Okay? So in, the, in that early plasma and in our universe now, we have this theory of dark matter, which is that there, there's more matter than we can see, and we don't know what it is, but we know it's there. So the matter that we're familiar with, that we can kick and touch and see, that's technically baryonic matter. All right, all the matter, protons, neutrons, electrons, okay, all the particles that we're familiar with, that's baryonic matter. And then there's this other kind of matter, which we call dark because we can't see it. It does not interact with electromagnetic waves. Why can I see that chair over there? Because electromagnetic waves bounce off it and come to my eye. But dark matter, we can't see because if a, a light wave comes to it and it hits, if there was a chair made out of dark matter, the light would come and just go right through the chair. And it, wouldn't, it would not bounce off the chair and come to my eye. So I wouldn't be able to see it. The only way you can see things is if, is if light bounces off them. So dark matter we call it dark because it does not interact with electromagnetic waves, which makes it really hard to detect because we detect everything by bouncing electromagnetic waves off it, right? How do we detect anything? Well, we either see it or we have a telescope or microscope that receives the electromagnetic wave from it, okay? So dark matter we can't see, but... Oh, also, we've observed, we think it makes up 27% of all the mass and energy in the universe. And these maps of fluctuations help us to investigate dark matter because we can explain some of these fluctuations, like, um, what was your name? Lucas. Like Lucas's question, what is, 
what, what do these fluctuations mean? Well, some of them can be explained using a theory of dark matter. So they, they, they provide evidence for the existence of dark matter. Because dark matter, while not interacting ele electromagnetically, does interact gravitationally. So you know how, uh, so gravity is the attraction between two massive objects. You guys heard that before? So when things are far apart, they don't really interact gravitationally. When they're close together, they do, if they're close enough together. In the early universe, when everything was closer together, right, that dark matter would interact with baryonic matter, whereas it doesn't as much now because things are farther away. So one type of interaction that happened in the plasma was, went like this. So in the plasma, I kind of lied to you before. I said there were electrons and protons, but there was also dark matter, which I'll just label it a D. Okay, there was dark matter as well. And so what happened in the plasma was that there would be regions that were more dense than others. So let's say here there was a dense region. Protons, electrons, and so on. So here's a very dense region of matter, right? The denser the, the region, the more it's going to collapse on itself because the gravity pulls it together. So this is going to get more and more dense until it gets too dense and the photons of light will cause it to expand. So it'll expand out. Because it got too dense, it's going to expand out. And what you get is you get a ring out here, as if you drop a rock in a, in a, in a lake, right? When you drop a rock in a lake, what happens? Ripples. The ripples out, go outward, right? And that's what happened here, is that the pressure from being so dense sent this matter outward, like, like the ripples from dropping a rock in the water. And so you get these rings of density that add a certain radius. And that can only happen if there's dark matter there. It can't be explained if there's no dark matter. And so the fact that we find fluctuations at certain radii suggests the existence of dark matter. Question? Like, how could you detect the dark matter if it can't be like, seen? Detected. Um, these fluctuations are one reason. So basically, what they found in these maps is that at certain distances, there are rings of density, where it's more dense. And there's no reason for them to be there, those rings, if there's no dark matter, because we wouldn't have this reaction that's taking place between the dark matter and the baryonic matter. But if we do have this dark matter, then we can explain why there are rings of, dense, of higher density at certain radii. So it's not that we're exactly directly detecting it, we're just seeing an effect that can be explained by a theory of dark matter. Is it direct proof of dark matter? No. It's just that it, it's in agreement with the theory of dark matter, this evidence. So you're absolutely right. First of all, we don't know for sure that this is caused by dark matter, and we actually don't know what the nature of dark matter is. Nobody knows what dark matter is made of, or how it works exactly. There are theories, but we still don't know. We're pretty sure that some kind of dark matter exists, because it explains so many things like this. It explains also um, why galaxies are sp spinning at the rate they do. Um, if you, It was actually in your article, I think, they talked about how they expect stars farther out in a galaxy to be spinning faster um, when really they're spinning slower, and that's explained by dark matter. Question. Uh, when did they discover, or not discover, but like come up with the theory of dark matter? Dark matter? Um, definitely uh, 1900s. I don't actually know the, the dates. I th think it may have been in the article, but I'm not sure in the chapter you guys read. Uh, other questions? And the cool thing 
Oh, I forgot to mention. So the, they found these rings in those maps. So these were rings of density in, those, in that early universe. And they said, huh, well, if there were rings in this early universe and the whole universe was just expanding, then there should be rings of higher density in our galaxies, right? Because this ring should just expand to a bigger ring. But there should still be a ring. And sure enough, there are rings of higher density in our universe. And the radius of those rings doesn't exactly match this, but that they, they've, they've mapped these rings onto those rings. And that's what this picture is sort of, is sort of, sort of showing, is that the rings in these maps can correspond to rings of higher density in the galaxy, in the universe, of higher density galaxies in the universe. Um, wouldn't they be wouldn't they be spheres? Because as a because they wouldn't be. Yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely, they would be spheres because it's a three dimensional world. So these are a two dimensional portrayal, so you can visualize it. Okay. The other thing is that if we can study the density of the universe of the early universe. Um, the density of the universe is critical to how our universe expands. If our universe is too dense, it's going to stop expanding because the gravitational pull of all the matter is going to pull the universe back onto itself. All right. So right now it's expanding, but if there's too much matter in the universe, it's going to collapse eventually, trillions of years. Okay, Because of the the pull of the matter. If it's under dense, if it's not dense enough, it'll expand infinitely in an unbounded way. It'll have this open geometry. And if it's critically dense, if, if it has a very specific density, then it's what's known as a flat geometry, meaning it'll expand infinitely, but in such a way that it's not curving away from itself. Don't worry, it doesn't make sense to me either. All right, there's different kinds of geometry that could be the shape of the universe. There's closed, open, and flat. Closed means if you go in a straight line, eventually you come back to where you started, just like the Earth's surface, right? Uh oh. Remind me. A closed geometry is one where you come back to where you started if you go in a straight line, like, the, like, like traveling around the Earth. An open geometry is one where, as you travel in a straight line, if two people set out in a straight line, they'll get farther apart from each other. And a flat universe is when two people going in a straight line will stay next to each other infinitely. And what they're finding is they still need to, to investigate a little bit, but they think it's flat. They think that our universe is infinite, in three dimensions, and they think um, it's a flat geometry, just because they've been able to make a map of the density of the universe thanks to the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so that's something else they're going to be investigating. One of my students uh, wrote a question that might relate to this. Uh, he was asking, what force is powering the expansion of the universe? That's a uh, great question. So they They've called it dark energy, which is different than dark matter. The expansion of the universe, the accelerating expansion, must be caused by something other than what we know. It can't be explained by any kind of matter that we've encountered or any kind of energy that we've encountered before. So they, made, they named it dark energy because it seems to exist, but we can't see it, just like dark matter. But it's dark energy that's fueling the expansion of our universe. And it actually seems to make up 75 to 80% of our universe. Okay? All of space, in other words. It, it seems to be a very part of the fabric of space, dark energy. But we just we can't detect it. We can't do anything with it. We can't harness it. 
I we just it just is the only thing that seems to explain the expansion of the universe. So according to the density of our universe right now, do we think that the expansion of the universe is accelerating or decelerating? We think that it is accelerating infinitely. We think that the universe is going to expand at an accelerating rate for an infinite amount of time right now. Wait, so will it like ever be dangerously like fast in time? You know, like that? Uh, not on a time scale that we would uh, have an issue with because yeah. the sun would go out well before. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you guys are starting to ask some good questions. So here are some of the unanswered questions that we've, we've got at, um, still, even with what we have with the CMB, which is, why is the universe so uniform at large scales? So if you zoom out, right, you see matter and space as being pretty uniform. But on a smaller scale, we look out and we see, okay, there's the Earth and then there's empty space and then there's you know, the moon and then there's empty space. It looks very non-uniform. So the question is, if you had this soup, the plasma of protons and electrons that was very uniform with small density fluctuations, how did that translate to a universe where you have a planet and then empty space and then a planet, right, and then a star, right? How did that structure come out of a uniform distribution of protons and electrons? What was the cause of matter coming together and making huge structures? That's one unanswered question. What's the shape? So we were talking about the flat geometry, but we don't really know for sure what the shape of our expanding universe is. That's they're pretty confident with, with the flat geometry, but um, still working on it. Can we find observable evidence for inflation? So inflation, does anyone know what inflation refers to specifically? At the very beginning of the Big Bang, there was a time, well, as part of the theory, there seems to have been a time where the universe expanded much, 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 much more rapidly than it is expanding now or expanded even after uh, recombination, even after the CMB was released. Faster than the speed of light. They think there was a time where the universe went from the size of an atom to the size of, think like a golf ball, which is like a billion times larger. And it happened in basically a billionth, 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 billionth of a second. They think it went, it got 10 billion times larger in, in 10 to the negative 34th seconds. Way faster than the speed of light. There's no evidence for this yet. But it's the only thing that can explain certain phenomena that have been observed. And I, I can't, I don't know them off the top of my head. So basically, inflation is a theory without evidence yet. But it seems to explain some things. But we'd like to observe something from it. What exactly is the nature of dark energy and dark matter? We're getting closer as we have ways of probing that, um, like the CMB. But then there's also unanswerable questions as opposed to unanswered, right? These ones, we have a chance. Maybe we can see something. These questions, what's the universe expanding into? We'll never know. There's no way for us to know because the farthest away we can see is the cosmic microwave background and what we're expanding into is farther than that, okay? It does not make sense for us to even ask what's out there because we'll ne we can never know. What happened before the Big Bang? The Big Bang invented time. There's, there's really no way of, I mean, you might as well say some uh, superpower or you know, religious deity started the Big Bang process because we'll never know whether that's true or not. It's, it's as true as it is false. How big is the universe? Well, we have a certain size where we can receive information from. That's 46 billion light years in radius. 
But outside of that, maybe there's more universe, maybe there's not. We don't know. How big is it? Infinite or not. We don't know. And that's the other thing. Oh, that's the, the question about the shape of the universe is that it seems flat to us, but so does the Earth. Right? So maybe it's just flat on a small scale that we can detect, and, and, and it's a sphere outside of that, just like the Earth. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask a question pertaining to that, because you were talking about how it could be a sphere or something flat, like mm -hmm. a, a three-dimensional cube. Yeah. But how would you ever know, because like it's gonna, a sphere that's infinite is always going to appear flat. No matter what. And there's never gonna that's be a that's a that's a, a great question. Is and, and the answer is that you can. There's other ways to tell. Basically, if you it has to do with geometry. And if you send two lines out parallel, if they curve away from each other, that tells you the shape of your universe. If they curve toward each other, that tells you the shape. If they stay parallel, it's more of a theoretical. You don't actually like yeah. send out lines, but. It's a geometry thing. So there's other ways to kind of infer the shape of the universe. So the Big Bang Theory is, is widely accepted because there's a great evidence for supporting it. It made predictions that were then observed, verified to be true. But there's holes in it. There's issues, like inflation is part of the Big Bang Theory, hasn't been observed yet. Um, there are other theories out there. And if observations are made, as our instruments get more and more precise, that lead us away from the Big Bang Theory and towards another theory, right? we'll have to adjust. But just because there's holes in this theory doesn't mean it's wrong. right? You can't just say, there's a gap in this, so I don't believe it. Because you have to have a better theory to replace it. And there's nothing better than the Big Bang Theory right now. It explains a large percentage of the observations made about the universe. So. Thank you so much, Mr. Fun. Diamond. Thanks, guys. I hope I, I had fun putting it together. So I hope you took something away from, from it, even if it's just more questions. Everything he said is going to be on the test. <laughs> I don't want to take that test. <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, um, we have a, you guys have a video for Monday. I think that's the only one.